Um, the, uh, I'm going to be talking about an interlocking series of studies exploring and going to be taking advantage of some of the findings of PGC of deconstructing overcoming schizophrenia. I'm looking at net neural networks and uh, function in schizophrenia. I have a zillion colleagues also. We have many, many contributors. And I'd like to thank the Liebers and the uh, BBRF, which last night I mentioned is an acronym. It's sort of like BRAF, BBRF, so that's good. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. All my conflicts are personal. <laughs> the challenges for schizophrenia research, and this echoes what Patrick said, to identify and understand the genes, which is being done in a broad context, as you, as you, as you just heard, and neural circuits and behavior, to close what I call the knowledge to wisdom gap. We have a lot of knowledge uh, about schizophrenia. We have a no lot of knowledge about genes. What we have, those are facts. What we have to convert it into is into an integrative wisdom. Uh, we need strong inference-based, oops, strong inference-based models. And I'm heading in the wrong direction, as usual. Can I go back? Um, and also understanding the time frame for progress. And I think Patrick nailed it. I think for that aspect, of schizophrenia, I think we're dealing with three to 10 years if the PGC, of which I'm a member, uh, keeps going at the great pace they're going. So the context of schizophrenia is this. This is the outline of the talk. And the goal, of course, is to close the knowledge to wisdom gap. So I'd like to thank my mentors, uh, Tim Beck in, uh, at, at Penn, Notch Calloway, uh, excuse me, Arnie Lazarus at Penn and, and Gail, and, uh, and Notch Calloway, who led a lot of neuro the neuropsychiatric revolution. I have a, actually a picture of my family here uh, that's not there. It's a lovely picture of my family, I assure you. <laughs> uh, one thing I say with this is that um, at a time when things were uh, going extremely well, uh, 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 my wife's in the audience, uh, and she does a lot of uh, uh, Alzheimer's caregivers research, my son developed a terrible uh, cerebellar brainstem encephalitis about 10 years ago. And I thought, having treated 14,000 patients, I understood the agony that families go through. A lot of, I know a lot of you have. Uh, I, I didn't really. Uh, I do now. Um, and it, it's an eye-opener when you actually open your minds and hearts. And that's what, in order, in order to get parity for our patients, we've got to make sure as a community to put pressure on politicians to get parity for our patients. Here's a story of a phenotype. Phenotype is an appearance of someone. This little girl in central Mexico, her life is doomed because of the implications of a congenital abnormality, cleft lip, cleft palate. I won't go through the medical anthropology, which my daughter has discussed of this. In two hours, a field hospital is set up by surgeons, and her life is totally transformed in two hours. Unfortunately, in schizophrenia, as this, oh, the yellow people, <laughs> they're not yellow people, they're yellow names of people, uh, are Lieber Award winners to show you the impact of the Lieber Awards and, and of the foundation. The majority of patients simply stop taking their medication. I won't go into why. Two things, though, are side effects and very bad uh, care system. This young girl uh, um, talked about her, uh, this is her painting, the fragmentation of her consciousness, which Bloiler talked about in 1900. And he was right. Schizophrenia, fundamentally schizo, a fragmentation of consciousness. But our phenotypes of our patients look normal. John Forbes Nash, who I'm lucky enough to know, uh, looks totally normal. And that's one of the tricky things, convincing people that this is a real disorder, a brain, no fault clinical brain disorder, when people sometimes look normal. Many of them don't because they're bereft of social uh, uh, supports. Now we'll get into the more of the science of this, genes and neural circuits. So in 1953, Crick and Watson said, 
you know, this, this, is, this DNA stuff is, might have considerable biological importance. That's a great, one of the great understatements in all of science. From then, just to give you the time frame, which you've heard about, from then till the opening of the Human Genome Project took 50 years, partly because we didn't have the commitment as a society to do it and for other reasons. So when you open the Book of Knowledge, here's what you see, a bunch of base pairs, three billion base pairs. So that starts the work in around 2000. The starts the work of what you've heard about of decoding this. How are these base pairs arrayed into genes? So since we're in a uh, musical environment, a uh, cathedral of music, uh, Paul Simon said this is the age of miracle and wonder. The miracle is that we've done the things we have. The wonder is what do you do next? And that's what I'm going to discuss with you. DNA, we each have six feet of DNA in each of our cells. Uh, there are three billion base pairs. There are 100 trillion cells. So there's enough lineage to go to the sun 70 times. That's the information manual for the human body that's being expressed. What's being built, where it's being built, and how it's being built. The knowledge to wisdom gap is transforming this into knowledge. Excuse me, integrative wisdom. So for the brain, genes code for 75 trillion neurons, and that's a lot of neurons. So in order to understand how, the, how this coding goes on, you have to rely on finding neural circuits. The genes code for neurons. The neurons are, are organized in neural circuits which subserve critical neurobiological functions. Of the three billion base pairs, what can one do? Here's Big Fido and Little Fido from the cover of Science Magazine. Here's a little red bandana, too. One base pair of the three billion in the insulin growth factor gene can determine small size in, 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 uh, in dogs, which is amazing. The problem is that's not what happens, as you've heard, in schizophrenia. In schizophrenia, we have many, many genes acting in concert or perhaps not in concert. And the phenotypes, what are they? Um, and the phenotype is a, uh, which I'm going to talk about for a minute, is the, or more. It's a, a specific quantitative biomarker. It's simpler than fuzzy diagnoses. And then the phenotype deficits occur in schizophrenia patients. And also, since genes are carried in, in, in family members who don't have schizophrenia but have schizophrenia relatives, so are endophenotypes, which are cognitive disturbances of memory and learning and other things, as you'll see. They're closer endophenotypes. The hypothesis is that they're closer to genes than diagnoses. They're closer to neural circuits and to clinical features. In fact, endophenotypes like memory and learning are now FDA approved as targets for new schizophrenia treatments. A question was asked about treatments. Uh, so the, the use of endophenotypes was for us a no-brainer back 12 years ago when, when the project started. In the COGS-1 and COGS-2 uh, studies, we have a family study of uh, 2,000 people, and the COGS-2 is the case control study of 76,000, uh, excuse me, that, that's incorrect, because this is an old slide. Uh, it's not 76,000 subjects, it's, it's uh, 2,500 subjects. Uh, so it's, the slide is lying, but I tried to correct it. The, uh, uh, and, and then you need very powerful statistical genetic methods to make sense of all of this. So many consortia, uh, the COGS was the first, the Consortium on Genomics of Schizophrenia, many consortia by many distinguished people look at cognitive and neurophysiological markers that run in schizophrenia families. Now, I'm just going to tell you one brief story. This is endophenotypes, uh, a hierarchical view. You start out, the, 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 uh, the whole foundation is genotyping. Patrick has discussed with you, Pam Sklar and the Broad of who have been mentioned have been extremely helpful. Our samples are now being PGC genotype. They weren't before. All the way up to, as you'll see, all the way up to real world function. That's what we're interested in, in improving how people navigate in life. If something is corrected in their EEG and they still are functionally impaired, that's not going to be very helpful. I'll tell you this story that I couldn't have imagined this eight years ago. So Mary Claire King, Mary Claire King who, um, found the breast cancer gene, 
sequenced our endophenotype-laden patients who have a lot of cognitive deficits. Then what we did is we got stem cell biopsies off their uh, skin, sent them to Rusty Gage and Kristen Brenand. Kristen's now at Mount Sinai. They're growing stem cells out of it and seeing the neuronal properties and how different kinds of interventions affect neuronal growth in these stem cells. So if you had told me this seven years ago uh, that we'd be doing this kind of work, I, I would say impossible. And so we are moving fast, not fast enough, but uh, we're making great progress. The COGS and the phenotypes are neurocognitive, as you'll see up here, uh, working memory, learning, vigilance, things that make sense to you, and then things that Greg Light will discuss, which are neurophysiological. In terms of one, uh, my favorite, <laughs> my favorite endophenotype, not that strange, but it is, is the, the, the lack of inhibition that patients show. They can't screen out multiple stimuli from the world. They become overwhelmed with sensory and cognitive uh, cues. And so they become uh, fragmented. They become cognitively fragmented. So this is the neurobiology of this, I'll show you, of this screening. So here are a lot of stimuli. The normal person screens them out and, and, get, and gets to the salient stimuli. The schizophrenia patient, unfortunately, doesn't do this. And we've known this for many years since McGee and Chapman, I think it was 1963. Greg Light and I have reported this. Uh, uh, this is what patients tell us. Everything's too loud. I get confused. I get overwhelmed. Uh, and so they have this infertile soil in which the stimulus filter gets fragmented, they get overwhelmed and cognitively fragmented, and also have negative symptoms, which are a withdrawal or a lack of things. Negative symptoms are important. Hallucinations and delusions, which Bloiler called secondary symptoms, are one thing. Negative symptoms are lack of engagement or lack of normal function. Withdrawal from the world, poverty of speech, not enjoying things and not engaging in the world. So how would, you, how would you measure inhibition? Well, you start out with a startle response, in my case. So what Landis and Hunt did in 1938, they wanted to study startle for a totally different reason. So they snuck up behind the subject. This is me sneaking up, stealthy. They took a starter's pistol and shot it behind the guy's ear. <laughs> so most internal review boards would not allow this kind of a protocol now. Hopefully, none of them would. <laughs> so, so this guy is a scared a poopless. And uh, how ubiquitous, because we wanted, we, we, UCSD, the translational program we've had for 30 years, looks at these kinds of measures before we looked at genomics and also looks at animal modeling. So how ubiquitous is, ubiquitous is the startle response? Well, here's an example. You have a little nine-banded armadillo walking around New Zealand at night. A nice National Geographic photographer is going to take its picture. Now, a startle is a response to a strong, intense, sudden stimulus. How are you going to take a picture of the nine-banded armadillo? You're going to have to light the picture. Flash. That acts as a startling stimulus, and here's what happens. <laughs> this is called the jack-in-the-box reflex for people who are interested in fine dining. <laughs> the uh, jack-in-the-box reflex of the nine-banded armadillo. All mammals will do this to sudden intense stimuli. OK, so what? Well, we want to measure inhibition, because inhibition fails in schizophrenia patients. So here's what you do. You give a loud, intense stimulus. You get a big startle response measured by the eye blink component of startle. And if you precede the startling stimulus by a little weak prepulse, this is neurophysiology, of course, you activate a frontal brain circuitry that's complex that we've examined for over 20 years, and that overlaps with things that probably are wrong in schizophrenia, functions that are wrong, structures that are wrong, misfiring in schizophrenia, and you knock down the startle. With the prepulse, prepulse it inhibits the startle response. Now, the hypothesis was, in this condition, with the prepulse, normals have small startle, and schizophrenia patients would have large startle. The only disagreement I ever had with my wonderful mentor, Notch Calloway, is about what this experiment would show. He claimed that I had it right, and I claimed that he had it right, which is, of course, the best way to have a, a mentor <laughs> um, relationship. 
And sure enough, schizophrenia patients are knocked down. They don't have pre They lose inhibition. They lose the ability to screen out stimuli. This is just one of the endophenotypes of the 20. So you can see this is highly labor intensive. In each lab of the 15 labs, each lab is studying patients for two days, drawing their bloods, getting DNA, and then studying them for two days on 20 different measures. Schizophrenia patients lose inhibition. Well, turned out we started a cottage industry uh, because there have been now not 3,000 citations, but 3,000. This shows you how science works. There have been 3,000 publications on just prepulse inhibition because it's very versatile and it has implications for many other disorders and for brain organization. So there have been 3,000 publications, and schizophrenia patients are a small part of this, but consistently show poor inhibition. Well, we're never going to know what they have because the slide doesn't show it. So I'll tell you, uh, unless the next slide has it. Oh, I see. Someone <laughs> enter stage right. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I am a failed actor. That's part of why I left New Haven. Uh, <laughs> heritability. They're heritable. The endophenotypes in general are heritable. We knew that going in. We, we hope that. They're associated with key schizophrenia-related genes, as you'll see. They have no neural circuitries. These are all things that are important if you're designing treatments and understanding schizophrenia. They're associated with negative symptoms and associated with negative symptoms and cognitive impairments and real-world functional impairment. So these endophenotypes are very versatile and useful. In addition, they're used to screen for an new antipsychotic compounds in animal models. Are COGS endophenotypes heritable? Absolutely. They run in families. In the same families where schizophrenia is heritable in our COGS cohort, Consortium on Genomics of Schizophrenia, the endophenotypes are also heritable. Memory, learning, many of these others. There are 20 altogether that are heritable. Are they associated with genes? Yes, and some of the genes overlap with the PGC genes. These are the endophenotypes on the x-axis, and the y-axis are genes. If you'll notice, neuregulin and ERBB4 are, have the most hits. These survived 25,000 simulations. I won't go through the statistics. These are it's very tricky statistically to look at neural networks and to look at gene networks. We have some of the best statisticians in the world doing this. Nick Shork, Laura Lazzaruni, John Blangero has helped us. And so what we find is this association. Now, how are these genes sorted? This was the kind of question that Patrick asked. Well, there's a gene network of 42 genes with neuroregulin and ERBB4 at its hub, and these output and are associated, this has been replicated three times by us on different populations, with glutamate. This is important because Joe Coyle, another Lieber Award winner, said, you know, schizophrenia patients have low glutamate levels in their, front, in their cort cortices. So theoretically, if you could do something to increase glutamate, that might be a new treatment for schizophrenia. So let's see how that worked out. I just have a few more slides. Precision or personalized medicine is this notion. You have a genetic finding. You have an associated, for us, with through endophenotypes. You have a genetic finding. And you have a treatment that's related to normalizing the endophenotype. And Cogs predicted, this is from the Harvard people, from Don Goff's lab, that glutamate precursors, remember the, the network shows low levels of glutamate? Glutamate precursors would, would reverse negative symptoms, which are associated with functional impairment. And that's exactly what happened. Except that if you give, if you give vitamin B12 and folate, it reverses negative symptoms and helps patients only if they have the right genotype, which you've heard about, which is why we will have to genotype people, and they have to be able to absorb and utilize these compounds to theoretically, because there's no direct measure of glutamate in the study, increase glutamate tone in the frontal lobes. So that's what precision medicine, and that's what we're pointing to with, with neuropsychiatric genomics. 
Greg Light will be talking later about Silo 2, which is if you knew nothing, if, if, if the deity, God, or whoever, stopped us from finding out anything else about genes, could we do anything? Well, there are things we could do. We can rewire the brain. And Greg Light's going to be talking about how we can rewire the brain using neuroplasticity. Having the genes will only help that endeavor. So, so in closing, let me just say, there are three pathways in advancing translational approaches. And the three pathways, I'm assuming, stage right is still there. I wrote this with my daughter, a medical anthropologist. Strong inference-based incremental advances. You take facts and build on them. That's what you've heard about, and that's how science usually proceeds. Second way that you've heard about is serendipity. The discovery of chlorpromazine by a French naval surgeon was because he was speaking to the patient, and the patient seemed to be less psychotic. If we have a health system, like we do, where patients are seen by doctors for 15 minutes every six weeks, no one's going to have what I call informed serendipity, because we're not going to know enough about the patients we're treating. That's why we need parity. That's why we have to fight for parity for our patients, parity being equal treatment medically. Thirdly, Cunian, a radical ship. Someone somewhere, not in a big fancy lab like mine, not in a big fancy university, is, may come up with a totally unique way of integrating the knowledge we have. Will that happen? I have no idea. Hope it does. The future, and this is the last slide, we have to bend the curve on clinical outcome. Using the knowledge that we're gaining, we have to bend the curve to better clinical outcome. We have to use what we already have. We have like, you saw Jeff Lieberman's slide. We have things that work. They're efficacious. Patients just don't take them. We need to give them voc rehab training. We need to give them support, family support, all those things. And that's the RAISE uh, project that Tom Insel at NIMH just mentioned to me two weeks ago. We also have to destigmatize psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, and we have to push ahead for parity. The last two or three things are we have to figure out how to, uh, neural circuits are very important in the NIMH portfolio. I think that and genomics. This is a combination of both to some degree. What we have to do is figure out how to identify wounded neural circuits. And here's the tricky part. Some of the circuits start misfunctioning prenatally in utero. That doesn't mean we can't repair them using sensory training, neurobiological, and genomic techniques. And those things hopefully will be discovered over the next, I would say, in the range of 10 or 20 years. We need early detection and prevention. You'd asked about early detection and prevention. I mean, we, we, we can't give antipsychotic medication to people at risk, but we can do cognitive and sensory training. The last two things are, this is easy. If you're a student and you're really smart and inquisitive, this is, this, is, this is probably the most vexing, interesting, dynamic problem in all of medicine, understanding schizophrenia, its genomic basis, and developing new treatments. And we have to close the knowledge to wisdom gap. Take everything we're learning, oops, I'm learning, I'm two minutes over, and, uh, and close this gap, which is considerable, because our knowledge exceeds our wisdom. And we're at the beginning now, uh, Janus is the god of beginnings, and the god of beginnings looked in both directions, backwards to what we have done and what we've learned, from Bloiler on, really. Even Bloiler and Kraepelin made great observations, and to the future, which you've heard about, hopefully, in the first two talks. I know the first talk, for sure. And so I'd like to just thank, these are many investigators at many of the, some of the COG sites, and uh, to the foundation, to the Liebers who've been so generous, and the Niederhofers in San Diego, and uh, to many other people who've contributed to this work. I can't list all the people, of course, because that would give me less credit. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that, that was really a joke. Um, and I'm sure the other people think it's a joke, too. So thank you very much for your kind attention.